Well, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we are returning to the book of Ephesians after having a 15-week break from this book. And I can tell you, for 15 weeks, I've been looking forward to getting back to Ephesians. If you were with us uh, before in our study, if, if you were with us uh, when we started this back in January, I told you way back then that the book of Ephesians is really broken down into two distinct parts. And that's where we divided the uh, study that we're going through. We did the first three chapters in the first half of the year. We're going to do the second three chapters in the second half of the year. The first three chapters are highly theological. The Apostle Paul was laying theological foundation for what he wanted to present now in these last three chapters, because the last three chapters, chapters 4, 5, and 6, are highly practical. You, if you were just to come down it with a single word, the first three chapters were about doctrine. The last three chapters are about duty. The first three chapters were about our creed. The last three chapters are about our conduct. The first three chapters were exposition of truth. Now these are an exhortation of truth. Let me try a couple more. The first three chapters were imp indicatives. The last three chapters are imperatives. The first three chapters are about our belief. The last three are about behavior. Exactly. Well, let's look at what the Bible says as, as we go through these passages together. Um, if you have slept since we were in chapters 1 through 3, you may want to go back and familiarize yourself with them. You may want to go back and read it a few times so that you can uh, see the profound concepts and truths that serve as the foundation for these practical uh, elements that we're going to be studying about for the next several months. Uh, the Apostle Paul does what any good parent does. Instead of just telling a child what to do, a good parent tells the child why you want them to do what you're wanting them to do. And no, because I told you so is not a good reason. <laughs> you give a foundation for why you are giving this instruction, and that's exactly what the Apostle Paul does. And we see this transition between the two halves of the book in the very first verse of chapter 4. Before we read the entire focal passage, I just want us to see the setup of verse 1 in chapter 4. Look at verse 1. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That word therefore refers back to the previous three chapters. All this theological truth, this rich doctrine he's been talking about, he says, now, therefore, here's what I want you to do. What does he want them to do? He wants them to walk. Walk. That's why I've entitled this series, Walk This Way. Paul's going to give us some shoe leather Christianity, how we practically live out the good news of the gospel. Now, you know, in that imagery of walking, I think it's significant. He could have said, live in a way that worthy of your calling, or he could have said, uh, love in a way worthy of your calling. He could have even said, grow in a way that is worthy of your calling, but he doesn't. He says, walk in a manner worthy of your calling, because walking, this imagery, it involves moving, doesn't it? It involves going forward, not going backward. It involves, there's a destination in mind. We're going somewhere, a target. It's progressing. It's intentional. It's deliberate. It's purposeful. It's measured. And what Paul's saying here, he's not really interested in just unsustainable bursts of zeal. He's talking about a sustained, steady life, a walk. And that's the image Paul wants us to have in our minds as we consider these practical instructions in these three chapters. Now, the word worthy there, the, the Greek word for worthy, walk in a manner worthy, uh, is the root word from where we get our English word axiom. Axiom. If you're an algebra teacher, you teach axioms. But Kristen's gone. I've looked over to Kristen because she's an algebra teacher. An axiom is a, an equation where both sides of the equation are equal to each other. Does that make sense? You, you remember algebra at all? Yeah? No? Some of you say, no, I don't remember any algebra. Well, the word axios in Greek actually means weight. So maybe I can explain it better, not algebra, but something a little simpler for us. Um, you've seen a balance or a scale, right? And so an axios is the weight that balances the scales to be even. So the point Paul's making is all this weight of doctrine from the first three chapters should be balanced with your life. The way you live should match 
should match, should be axiomatic to the first three chapters. That's what he's trying to say here. And then he says we walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. What is the calling to which we've been called? Again, the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. In the first three chapters, Paul went through great lengths to describe and to enunciate the tremendous calling we have as believers. All the way back in chapter 1, we saw that it was through the calling of God the Father that he chose us before the foundation of the world. And then we learned that it's because of the work of Jesus Christ that he purchased through the shedding of his blood the great salvation we enjoy, and we've been adopted as sons and daughters, heirs of God through the work of God the Son. And then that calling led to us being sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, and we are kept by God the Spirit. God the Father called us and chose us. God the Son purchased us, and God the Spirit sealed us. And he says, because of this great, tremendous calling to which you have been called, live your life axiomatic. Live your life in balance to this great calling, this Trinitarian salvation. Walk this way. Now let's read the entire focal text as that little introduction started us off here. Here's what the Bible says. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean that, but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Again, the theme here is unity. Unity, walking in unity. Again, back to verse 1, Paul does something in verse 1 that he often does whenever he's giving a a teaching or an instruction. He establishes his credibility to be teaching. He gives us his credentials. He did that in chapter 1, verse 1, when he said that I am an apostle of Jesus Christ by the very will of God. And so the theological truth that Paul communicates then has this credential. It has this credibility. I'm giving you this because I'm an apostle, but I find it interesting the way he shows us his credibility to be giving us this practical instruction. He doesn't say, I'm an apostle of the Lord. He says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Remember, he's writing this from prison. He's writing this under guard of a Roman soldier. It's as if he's saying this. Listen, if you're going to live out the practical aspects that I'm talking about. If your life is going to be worthy and balanced to that great truth and that great calling you have, there will be some very real life implications. He's saying there's some sacrificial consequences. Be prepared for some life adjustments if you walk worthy of your calling. And friends, this is why. For us to present Jesus as just an addition to your life is selling the gospel short. Just to present 
the gospel of Jesus as kind of an addendum that's going to make your life better. That's selling the gospel short. Friends, following Jesus requires total commitment. Following Jesus means full surrender. And there's four things about following Jesus this way, walking worthy of our calling, that I want us to see from this passage today. The first thing he instructs us as a church is this. Number one, be on guard for the unity of the church. Be on guard for the unity of the church. I find it fascinating as we transition now to the practical section of the book of Ephesians that Paul could have started with any subject he wanted to in the practical section. I mean, think about it. Of all the things he could have talked about, he could have talked about evangelism. He could have talked about missions. Is evangelism and missions important? Of course it is. It's vital. It's the mission of the church. But that's not what he starts with. He could have started with talking about uh, how we need to stand firm in our faith in the shifting culture in which we live. But he doesn't start there. He could have started by talking about having a private devotional life, the importance of prayer. He doesn't go there. He could have talked about how we need to care for the needs of the poor and welcome the outsider and the outcast. But when Paul says the first thing I want to talk about in the practical living out of your life of calling, it's the unity in the church. It's the unity among believers. He instructs us to be on guard with diligence for the unity within the local congregation. Notice again how he put it in verse 3. He says, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Friends, Paul is desirous that the church in Ephesus and the church in Lookout Valley be diligent, be eager to maintain a very deep, real, and personal unity within the body. He's not speaking here of the larger universal church. The universal church is all Christians in all locations throughout all of church history. He's not talking about the universal church. He's talking about the local church. We must diligently guard and protect here in this local congregation the unity of Lookout Valley Baptist Church. Why? Because we are to be a reflection of the heavenly unity. You see, God's calling on us as Christians is not solely to a private, personal relationship with Jesus. Yes, our relationship with God is personal, but it was never intended to be private. It's intended to be lived out in community with other people up close, rubbing shoulders. We are called, we're actually commanded in Scripture to live our Christian lives in community with other believers in what's known as the church. And because that's the case, he's presenting here the kind of qualities the kind of character traits that will enhance our life together as believers. In the book of Colossians, there's a parallel passage to this where he gives the same type of instruction to the church in Colossae. And when he uses it there, he, he uses dressing language. He said, clothe yourselves with these things. These are kind of things we put on. Three attitudes, particularly in verse 2, that are crucial attitudes necessary for accomplishing the goal of maintaining the unity within the body. Look at verse 2 again. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. I want to just spend a few moments on these three uh, character traits, these three attributes, because they're so important for us to maintain the unity in the body. First of all, humility, being humble. Being humble is not being shy. Sometimes people think of humility as being, well, self-deprecating or self-abasing. No, this is what humility is. Humility is very intentionally and purposefully laying aside your own rights, laying aside your own wants, laying aside your own desires and opinions and considering other people first. That's what humility is. In fact, Jesus even told us to take this yoke of humility on. Jesus demonstrated this kind of humility. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and 
lowly in heart. That word that's translated lowly in Matthew 11 is the exact same word that's translated humble here or humility here in Ephesians 4. You know, few things are more destructive in the life of a church like pride and arrogance. But those very things, pride and arrogance, God actively opposes people who demonstrate pride and arrogance. So be humble. The next word, gentle. Gentleness. What what is gentleness? It's a mild, calm disposition. It's a self-controlled spirit. In other passages, the Apostle Paul points out the power of of this discipline of gentleness. He talks about how if there is sin within the body, the way we confront that sin, the way we deal with that sin is in gentleness. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him, how? In a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness. Friends, gentleness diffuses tense situations. Gentleness calms down hostilities. Being gentle sounds weak, but friends, being gentle is the furthest thing from weakness. It takes incredible strength to maintain a spirit of gentleness in a difficult situation or when confronting sin or when you want vengeance because you've been wronged by someone. Be humble, be gentle. Thirdly, be patient. Be patient. Patience is this compassionate long-suffering of the faults of others. There's times in the church when people let us down. I won't ask for a show of hands, but you just raise your hand to yourself. Have you ever been let down by somebody in the church? Don't do it. Don't do it. I know you want to. We all have. It'd be unanimous. As a leader, there are times people say, yeah, I'll do this, and they don't do it. There are people say that, yeah, I'll do this ministry, and they're spurts of energy for a period of time, and then all of a sudden they prove unreliable. Patience is the virtue that's necessary to preserve the unity of the body in those times. The term here for patience in the Greek is a compound word, macrothumeo. Macro means long, thumos means heat or anger, long heat, long anger. In other words, it takes you a long time to get angry. This is the opposite of being quick-tempered. This is the opposite of having a short fuse. And you know, in Exodus chapter 34, whenever Moses asked God to show him his glory, he said, you can't see all my glory, but I'll pass by you. I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll speak my glory to you. One of the things he said was that he was long-suffering, that he was patient, This is a character of God, and friend, the closer you get to God, the more you start to look like him. These attitudes of humility, of gentleness, and patience, these are countercultural. This is not the way the world around us lives. The world is not humble. The world is not gentle when they've been wronged, when the waiters brought them the wrong meal. The world is not patient. These are the attitudes that grow a church. These are the attitudes that continually build up the body of Christ. We live, would you agree with this, in a narcissistic, self-centered world. It's all about me world. But not only that, if we're honest with ourselves this morning, we see this pride and this self-centeredness even lurking in our own souls. So it takes the power of the Spirit to clothe ourselves, to put on humility, gentleness, and patience that enables us to achieve God's design for his church. They're also expressed, Paul says, because of our agape love for each other. He says, bearing with one another in love. Most often when that term bearing is used in the New Testament, it's talking about bearing up under persecution as Christians, bearing up under opposition and hostility from the world. But here, Paul uses it to talk about how we deal with each other. Bearing with one another, how? In love, in unconditional love. And when we do that, friends, we're showing our eagerness to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Some translations say, make every effort or be diligent to maintain the unity. The point is this. Let's not worry about everyone else making their effort to maintain the unity. Let's individually 
make every effort to maintain the unity, to build the unity. He says the unity of, spirit, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This unity of the Spirit is that unity that we have because we've been born again by the Spirit of God, and we now have peace with God. We are under a bond of peace with God, and that's what unites us. So we tend it carefully. Friends, it doesn't just happen. It's not just a natural result of being together. It requires work. It requires intentionally. We listen humbly. We talk gently. And we forgive patiently because God explains that he's given us this spiritual unity in Christ. Now, when you get to verses 4 through 6, Paul slips back into the theological. He's really theologically minded, so he goes back into the theological to try try to reestablish the foundation and the basis for what he's saying. And many scholars believe verses 4 through 6 is actually a very early Christian creed that these Christians in Ephesus would have been familiar with already, and he's just quoting to them this Christian creed. Look what he says in verse 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, as just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Do you see the repeated word there? One. He's saying, listen, this is the unity that we're one because of all these things. But did you also notice what this creed talks about or mentions? First, it says one spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. One Lord. This is Jesus the Son. One God and Father. This is God the Father. This is a Trinitarian unity. The point being is this. As unimaginable as it would be to separate the Trinity, so should it be to separate believers in Jesus Christ. We were born again by the Father and the Son and the Spirit. We're kept by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So we should walk in unity together just as the Trinity. But here's the caveat. Just because we demonstrate humility, gentleness, patience, we bear with one another in love, that does not mean Ongoing sin in the church is not dealt with. It does not mean we don't confront wickedness that pops its head up. The way we confront is the key. I want you to consider this striking instruction the Apostle Paul gives to Titus. Paul sent Titus, his preacher boy, his son in the faith, to Crete to establish and to firm up the little pocket churches that were popping up on that island. Notice what he tells Titus in Titus chapter 3. He says, As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Again, we don't just let sin run rampant, and divisiveness is sin. Most, most of y'all know this past week I was in Florida uh, officiating a funeral for a longtime family friend, and I spent the week at my dad's house, and in our time together, he shared with me about a recent uh, difficulty he had in the church where he serves. He's a longtime Sunday school teacher, been teaching adult Sunday school for about 40 years now, and um, he shared with me that there was a man that started attending their class who every Sunday, he was very divisive. My dad would be teaching something. The man would say, that's not right. He'd say something else. Say, well, I don't believe that. Teach a little bit more. He'd say, well, you've got that wrong. (laughs) This became so awkward and uncomfortable. Finally, a couple of ladies in the church went to the senior pastor and said, Pastor, I don't know if you've heard what's going on in our class, but there's a man who's been attending. He's a member of the church. He just started attending, and he's incredibly divisive. So the pastor set up a meeting with my dad and this gentleman, and the, the, I say gentleman, <laughs> and uh, talked to him gently, said, you know, you can't be stirring up division in the church. You can't be so divisive in your class. And he says, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Next Sunday rolls around, guess what happens? Oh, that ain't right. <laughs> you got that wrong. So again, the pastor hears about it. They call him in again and uh, gave him another warning, gently told him regarding the unity of the church here. Next Sunday he rolls around, what happens? 
You got that wrong. <laughs> so finally, after that class, my dad went to the man and said, no longer come into our class again. Do not come back in here. Wow. One of this man's friends came to my dad and said, hey, why don't you give, just give me like a 30-day grace period? <laughs> my dad went to this passage in Titus and said, we warned him once, we warned him twice. He's warped and sinful and self-condemned. He's no longer in the church. But here's the deal. The, the reason why unity is so difficult among us is because preserving the unity can be difficult. It's hard. Because one of the things is we're all different, right? We're different ages. And I think that's a beautiful thing, particularly about this congregation. I go to some congregations, they're all 20s. And one of my, my dad's congregation, it's all 80s. <laughs> but we're a diverse congregation. And that can cause division. We have different genders, different races, different backgrounds, different preferences, different families, different personalities, different talents, different experiences, different gifts. We're all very different. And those differences could cause division. But not only are we to guard the unity, but here's the second thing I want us to see. Number two, we should be grateful for the diversity. We should be grateful for the diversity that we have within this church. Instead of our differences being a reason why unity is fractured among us, those differences should actually be a source of thanksgiving to God. Notice how he put it in verse 7. He said, but grace, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, now what Paul's talking about here is the diversity that exists within our church, within the church in Ephesus, with regard to spiritual giftedness. There is this grace giftedness that is unique to every single Christian. All of us have different backgrounds, different experiences, different personality types. Uh, we end up on different places on the personality profile tests, and we have different God-given spiritual gifts. So we're different. But here's the thing. The giftedness that God has given you and that God has given me, it's not for you. Your gift was given to you for everybody else. Did you hear that? The gifts you have were given to you for everybody else. Paul often referred to gifts as grace gifts, like he talks about them here. Grace was given in 1 Corinthians 12 and in Romans 12, the Greek word that's used for grace gifts there is the Greek word charismata. You hear an English word in there? Charismatic. Listen, every Christian who's been born again by the Spirit of God is a charismatic because every Christian has been given grace gifts. That's what the word literally means. We've all been given grace gifts. That's the diversity Christ has created within his church. And here's the implications of that. It means that everyone, listen, Everyone is important in the life of the church. There's no one in the church that is unimportant. Every member is to be a vital part. You may be here this morning and say, you know, I don't feel like I have anything I can contribute. That is a lie from the evil one. If you're a Christian, you have been gifted by the Spirit. That means you have something to contribute, something to give. Now, you may be here this morning and say, well, yeah, but you don't know about this big whopper of a sin I did a long time ago. I think I'm disqualified for serving in the church. The Apostle Paul is exhibit A for that excuse. The Apostle Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. If there's anybody that should be disqualified for their resume of wickedness, it's me. But Paul was used powerfully by God in the church, and God can use you too. He doesn't give you spiritual gifts because you've performed well. He gives you spiritual gifts because he loves you. And then Paul uses a fascinating Old Testament passage to describe how these spiritual gifts came to be, how the diversity we enjoy because of our diverse giftedness were extravagantly poured out upon us. He quotes from Psalm 68 in verse 8 of Ephesians 4. Look at verse 8 again of our focal passage. Paul says, Therefore it says, and here's the quotation, When he ascended on high... He led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. 
Now, there's a winding explanation for Paul's train of logic in these 8, 9, and 10 verses. I'm not going to go through the long explanation. If you want to know, I've got eight commentaries I read this week. You're welcome to come read them in my office sometime. I'm going to try to simplify as much as I can. Here's Paul's train of logic. In Psalm 68, the psalmist is praising God for his victory over his enemies. First, he begins to praise God about his victory over the captivity the Israelites had in Egypt. And he brought them out by his power. And then he established them. And then he showed his presence to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai as he spoke with Moses and gave him the Ten Commandments. And the psalmist praises God for that victory. And then the psalmist begins to praise God for his victory over the enemies of the people of God there in Israel, the Jebusites, namely. And God is praised by the psalmist because now, he says, we have the presence of God on Mount Zion, where the tabernacle and the temple would be, the Ark of the Covenant there in the Holy of Holies, which represents the manifest presence of God. And then the, the imagery that the psalmist uses to describe God's victory over the enemies of God's people is the imagery of an ancient conquering warrior. When a king would go off into battle, when a king would lead his army to war and he would win that war, what would he do? He would capture prisoners of war. He would go into that dominion and he would gather up all their valuable possessions and those would be the spoils of war. And then what happens? There's a great parade that comes from that battleground into back the capital city of Israel. And the king is with all of his army, and they're bringing in these captives, and they're bringing in the spoils of war. And then what does the king do? He begins to distribute those spoils of war to the people as gifts. This is how extravagant God's gifts of the Spirit are to us. He mentions in verse 9 and 10 how Jesus descended from heaven to earth. That's his incarnation. And you need to know something. When Jesus came to planet earth, it was war. It was a battle. Satan threw at Jesus everything he had in his arsenal. He tempted him in every way possible. But not only that. The very religious leaders who should have received Jesus as the Son of God and the Messiah of Israel, they rejected him. His closest friends betrayed and abandoned him. And then the the government of Rome, they put him on a farce of a trial and they hung him on a cross till he died. They buried him in a tomb. We could look at that and we can think, ah, the battle's over, but the battle's not over. Here's why. See, Jesus never succumbed to the temptation. He surrendered his will to the will of the Father and was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. But that was Friday. Here comes Sunday. Sunday, he was resurrected from the dead. For the next 40 days, he appeared to hundreds of people until he was ascended on high. And then what happened after the ascension of Jesus? He told them before he ascended, go to Jerusalem and wait. What's going to happen in Jerusalem when they wait? The spoils of war are going to be poured out. The gifts of the Spirit came down on Pentecost Sunday. And friends, the gifts we have today, the gifts that you enjoy as a Christian, that you're called to use and to serve, they're the spoils of Christ's war. The battle he fought, he fought to save you and to gift you so that you could use your giftedness in the church. And that really leads to the third thing, and that is this. Be giving in your ministry. Be giving in your ministry in the church. Now, when you get to verse 11, Paul begins to list some of the leadership gifts that Christ has distributed to his church. These are not all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are really the leadership or the teaching gifts that Christ has given in his church. There's four that he mentions. Let's look at verse 11 again. And he gave, there's this concept of the grace giftedness. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers, and I should You say, well, you miscounted. There's five. No, there's four. Shepherds, teachers is one office, one giftedness. Four distinct areas of giftedness that God has given to his church. Two of them were offices and and gifts that were for the foundation of the church. And two of them are manifest in the church today. The first two gifts he mentions are the apostles and the prophets. These are the men that God specifically ordained and equipped by the Holy Spirit to lay the doctrinal foundation of the church of Jesus Christ. They wrote our Bible. 
Paul mentions this foundation in two chapters earlier, in chapter 2, verse 19. Look at it on the screen. Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That's the church. What's the church built on? Church is built on the foundation of who? The apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So God used these gifted apostles and prophets to proclaim the gospel in the first century and to write the New Testament. This is why we don't have blank pages in the back of our Bible. The Bible is complete. There's no more addition to the Bible. So this office and position of apostle and prophet was for that New Testament era. But in addition to the apostles and prophets, he's also gifted the church with these next two evangelists and shepherd teachers. Shepherd teachers, again, those who have a teaching capacity within the church. Evangelists, those are the ones that are on the front lines of evangelism. Think missionaries. Missionaries are the frontline evangelists. They go into these regions of the world where the gospel has never been proclaimed. They go into the dark places in the, every corner of the planet to proclaim the gospel. And what do they do when they get there? They see converts come to faith in Jesus. And these pockets of believers start to meet together. What do we call those? We call those churches. They plant churches in those regions. And then after they plant those churches, they try to identify by the work of the Spirit men who look particularly gifted to shepherd. <laughs> And then you have pastors of those churches. Pastors. Some of your translations may say pastor. It says shepherd in the ESV. Some translations say pastors. In our church, we have five pastors, elders. Two of them are full-time employees, myself and Wade. Three of them don't get paid a dime. Mike Sarton, Gene Self, and Ronnie Brown. These are the shepherds of this local congregation. And this church has recognized that these men have this giftedness. I've often described the shepherding ministry of a pastor, of a shepherd, in, in a threefold way. He leads the flock, provides direction. He feeds the flock. He teaches and instructs, and he tends the flock or cares for the flock. In fact, notice how Paul describes the leading and feeding ministry of pastors in verse 12. He says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. This is what I mean by everyone giving their ministry. Because it's not just pastors who do ministry. It's all the people in the church who do ministry. You know, we're coming up on NFL football season. Uh, Bree season started last week. My Buccaneers lost to the Steelers. I was sad about that. But you have NFL football. Sometimes we think of church like NFL football or Major League Baseball or NBA basketball. You come as a spectator to watch the paid professionals to do the work. That's not a picture of the church. We don't come to watch the paid professionals, the clergy, do the work of ministry. A better picture would be this. Those who are on the court, those who are on the field are the church. The paid professionals, if you will, they're the coaches on the sideline who are equipping the team. And listen, the more the team runs those plays in harmony and perfect unity and beauty, it gives witness to all the spectators, the world. Boy, there's something different about this team. It's the saints, the individual members of the local church who are to be doing the work of the ministry through the extravagant grace gifts purchased by Jesus in his war on the cross and resurrection from the dead, which really leads to my fourth and final thing I want us to see from this passage this morning. As we function in our giftedness and do the work of ministry, it will result in this final thing. Number four, be growing toward maturity. We must be growing toward maturity. This is the end result of guarding the unity, of being grateful for the diversity and of giving away our ministry as we'll be growing toward maturity. I want us to read the last four verses again of this passage just to see how they tie in together. Again, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, that's us, 
joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Friends, as we guard the unity, as we celebrate the diversity, as we give away our ministry, we will grow into maturity. That's what Paul's presenting here. And Paul gives us some insight into what maturity looks like. Mature believers are not easily tossed to and fro by the latest doctrinal fad that comes down the pike. Mature believers start to look more, start to act more, start to talk more like Jesus. Mature believers serve one another. They equip one another. They work together to build up one another. And this idea of growing into maturity, it's not supposed to just be happening in little pockets in the church. Well, we've got these D groups over here, and they're really growing in maturity. We've got this class over here. Man, they really get deep into it. They're, they're really growing in maturity. The concept is we're all together growing into maturity. The whole body growing together. And what does this process look like? Again, verse 15, he says, Rather, speaking the, church, the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way. Now, this, every English translation I read of this passage really kind of rendered the Greek not quite the way it should be. And they translated a participle there that's not really there in the original, speaking. The, the word for speaking in Greek is not even in the original text. The, the participle is truth. So in other words, we are to be truthing in love. Truthing in love. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're founded on the truth. We're rooted in the truth. We're based on the truth. We're called in the truth. And so in our life together, we are truthing the, in love. That the, the truth of the gospel is central to who we are and to what we do. It's not just speaking in love, but it's living in love and doing in love and imparting the truth in love. This is the medium, the truth in agape love that maximizes church growth. And I'll just close with this. What is true church growth? In, in our world as pastors, we read articles and books about church growth. But I'm here to tell you what Paul was not talking about. Paul was not talking about the next new fancy building. That wasn't church growth. He wasn't talking about breaking attendance records, high attendance Sunday and Sunday school. That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about expanding budgets of the church or adding new staff members to the church. That's not true church growth. Well, then what is he talking about? True church growth is when we're living in unity together and we're all looking more like Jesus. That's real church growth. And that leads to my last thought. True church growth is accomplished through submission to Christ as head and service to each other in love.